two days is coming to the end of its first week with fierce resistance being mounted by the Ukrainian armed forces and by average citizens willing to fight and die in defense of their country. The U.S. and its NATO allies have issued crippling economic sanctions against Russia, Putin, and his fellow oligarchs, and many nations are contributing military equipment and ammunition. But the question is, are we doing enough to support a fellow but fledgling democratic nation, not just to save them, but to send a message to other bad actors who might act similarly in the future? We spent this hour getting the thoughts of the former commanding general of the United States Army in Europe, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges. Welcome to the program. Thank you for being here. Mike, thank you for this privilege. You're welcome. And before we start, it should be noted that General Hodges will be speaking at noon today at the World Affairs Council Charlotte Luncheon at the Uptown Hilton. Seats are still available, and you can get them through uh, worldaffairscharlotte.org. Let me start with a basic question. Has the approach of the United States and the approach of the NATO allies been the right one so far in this conflict? I agree that it's the right approach. We just started too late, or uh, we started late on several aspects. It's not too late yet, and you can feel kind of a growing um, uh, momentum from nations around the world to provide capability to Ukraine, to, to provide the necessary diplomatic pressure and economic pressure on Russia. So this is the right approach. I, th I just think we started uh, late and now we're, now we're trying to catch up. We're not sending troops to Ukraine, but the United States has beefed up its support of NATO. I've forgotten the exact number of troops that we have sent in, but you have said that the deployment of additional US troops to NATO's eastern flank was a good move. Uh, given that NATO forces have also chosen to stay out of this conflict, why is that a good move? So four weeks ago, I was in Kyiv and I had the chance to meet with President Zelensky. Um, he's an unconventional uh, leader, obviously, not a career politician, so it doesn't speak like a career politician, but he impressed on me um, a real fighting spirit. Uh, this was four weeks ago. And he said, look, I don't need U.S. troops. I don't need British troops. I don't need German troops here in Ukraine. I need the tools so we can defend ourselves. And I need financial support uh, to keep our economy afloat, because obviously uh, Russia was trying to crush their economy, which would lead to the collapse of the government. And he wants to grow the size of his own armed forces over the next three years. Um, so there's, there's not a need for U.S. boots on the ground, if you will, inside Ukraine. Uh, it would be helpful, frankly, um, if we had something called a no-fly zone, which many people are, are calling for, but I also don't think this is feasible unless the alliance changes the guidance about having NATO troops inside Ukraine. A no-fly zone, of course, is not something that you just declare. It has to be enforced, which means you would have U.S., Royal Air Force, German Air Force, and other allies in the skies over Ukraine, inevitably going head to head with Russian aircraft. And of course, this is what everybody's trying to avoid, something that has a NATO versus Russia uh, kinetic conflict. And by the way, if you're trying to enforce a no-fly zone, you also have to be able to um, destroy air defense systems on the ground. So we would potentially be attacking Russian air defenses inside Russian so sovereign territory and uh, you have to be prepared to go in and pick up a pilot that gets shot down. So for several reasons, a no-fly zone is a complicated uh, decision with, with many considerations. So having said all that, to, to finally answer the rest of your question, why is it a good decision to, to reinforce the eastern flank? I think it's important because our allies, especially Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania there that are so close to Russia and, and Belarus, are of course very concerned um, if this fighting should spill over somehow. Um, so it's, it's partly there to speed up the time we have to react versus wait until there's a terrible crisis to then try to bring troops over from say Fort Bragg, North Carolina or Fort Campbell, Kentucky. The uh, other reason this is important though, it's a signal to the Kremlin. Do not let it spill over. You are responsible for what's going on here do not let it get out of hand, as these things often do. Uh, th this is part of the reason for reinforcing that eastern flank. 
You mentioned uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky uh, saying he needs money and equipment to equip his armed forces during this crisis. And he was offered a safe passage out of the country, I think, by the United States. And he said, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition, which is a pretty brave thing to do, it seems to me. But from a military point of view, even if we could supply him all of the equipment and ammunition that he would require, is his army well trained enough? Is it large enough? to fight what appeared to be uh, overwhelming uh, forces from Russia? So uh, that's a, a great question. Um, of course, the Russians have significant advantage in terms of air power and in sea power. But when it comes to land forces that are actually involved in the conflict, uh, Ukraine has as many or more soldiers available than Russia. Now, Russia could eventually bring empty the barracks all over this massive country and keep pushing them forward. But that's just numbers. Um, that doesn't mean these are actual trained, ready to fight, uh, cohesive units. So um, it, when it comes to the ground fight, they have enough people, plus they're defending their own country. And, and you're, we're all watching how the civilians are turning out to, to be prepared to do that. We're, we're watching uh, clogged roads of hundreds of thousands of people trying to get out of the country, heading toward places like Poland, where they can cross the border into relative safety. So what, what, what logistical problem does that provide NATO countries, including our own, if they want to supply uh, more ammunition, tanks, uh, equipment, etc.? How, how do we get it in now that the conflict is going and Russia is making some uh, headway here? Well, um, you can imagine that the logistical planners from U.S. European Command and from NATO, as well as the nations uh, like Poland um, and, uh, and Ukraine, are figuring out a distribution network that can bring things in while you've got, as you very correctly observed, you know, thousands of cars heading west, yet you're trying to bring in convoys of equipment um, and I would also expect that you've got commercial aircraft, charter aircraft that are delivering um, pallets of Javelin, for example, and, and other needed equipment and supplies into various airfields uh, around Western, uh, Western Ukraine. This is a challenge, but th this is the key part of this challenge. Um, the Ukrainian ground forces have slowed up. That They're stopping the Russians for a period of time. So can we keep them in the fight? Ukraine is not a, a NATO member state, although it wants to be, and they are a partner country to NATO. And I think uh, NATO would welcome them in in normal times uh, uh, in relative short order after they go through whatever hoops you go through to become a NATO uh, country. But uh, in the special circumstances that Ukraine is facing now, with their status as a partner nation to NATO. Shouldn't, shouldn't that have spurred NATO nations into something bigger than what we're doing now? Or is the, is the goal here simply to not escalate this into World War III? Well, I think um, the, the reaction of the nations, uh, including our own nation, has evolved um, over the last several months um, as uh, people transition from uh, dismissive to disbelief to wow, he really did this. Putin is really killing civilians. They're bombing towns as we've all watched uh, almost indiscriminately. And we have a humanitarian uh, tragedy underway with hundreds of thousands of refugees. I mean, this is, so you're seeing each nation kind of go through this transition. I mean, you remember the United States last summer, we were talking about, hey, don't be using cyber against us, you know, and um, you really need to respect international law and we need to have all these conversations. And now here we are uh, doing everything we possibly can to help Ukrainian armed forces destroy Russian forces. And you've got just about the entire world minus three or four outliers joining in every form of sanction uh, that's available. Um, so I, I think that um, the alliance is, is frankly, it's, I've been impressed that Secretary General Stoltenberg and with US leadership have kept the alliance together. Hungary is a problem. Hungary is a member of NATO. Hungary is a, an EU nation, but yet they will not allow weapons to transit Hungarian uh, roads, rail, or airspace. This, this is unbelievable to me. Um, so I think there's going to be intensive pressure on Budapest uh, that they're going to have to change their policy. And by the way, Hungary has an election on 3 April. 
And we may find out if, if Prime Minister Orban really is the guy that they want to keep at the head of government. That brings up some more questions about NATO. They were founded in 1949 specifically to counter the threat of a post-war Russian expansion in Europe. Could it not be argued that this is what we're witnessing unfolding and they're not following through on their whole reason for being? Uh, no, I would disagree with you, Mike. This is okay. uh, The alliance was created for the collective defense of its members. So not responsible for all of Europe. But there is a reason, of course, that um, just about every nation that ever was a um, Soviet Republic, such as the Baltic countries, uh, Georgia, Ukraine, um, and uh, former Warsaw Pact countries like Poland and Romania um, uh, wanted to join NATO as fast as they could. At the first opportunity, they lined up saying, I want to be a part of this collective defense because they know what it's like being under, uh, under the Kremlin. Um, that's that's a, a powerful um, demonstration of that. I think, though, that the alliance uh, does have to be um, careful about how does it react to what's happening on its periphery. You know, the alliance acted uh, decisively back in the uh, 1995. You'll remember the Dayton Peace Accords because of the genocide that was happening in the former Yugoslavia. And so the alliance, for the first time in its history, went what we would call out of sector, beyond the, the sovereign boundaries of NATO nations, in order to help um, Im implement a peace accord in that country. And by the way, Russia was even a part of that. They, they worked with us back then. That seemed appropriate. And I could imagine um, a scenario at some point where the alliance takes on a more active role, but it, again, Keeping the alliance together is, is task number one for, for President Biden. Despite the, the peace discussions that began yesterday with little effort, with, with little result, uh, the, the Russians stepped up the bombing in various places around Ukraine yesterday as well. Uh, although they have been bogged down in their invasion, many people, including Putin, I'm sure, thought this would be over in two yeah. days. And we've heard the stories that he thought allegedly thought that uh, his troops would be uh, greeted as peacekeeping saviors, essentially liberating these people from this corrupt government that he alleges exists in Ukraine. That has not been the case. So is what's going on the result of bad planning? Uh, Soviet troops, uh, not, excuse me, Russian troops that are not as, as well-trained as we think they should be? Or is this strictly because of the resistance that the uh, uh, Ukrainians are putting up both from their military and from civilian sources? I would say yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> uh, uh, with, with, without a doubt, what we're seeing from Ukrainian armed forces is, is incredible. Um, but I've been watching them for eight years. We, we help train them um, and they learn so fast and, and, and uh, they are very tech savvy. And um, I, uh, think that it's probably surprised the Russians at how well uh, they're fought, they have fought. And of course, they're defending their own home country. And which is important. And then we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go uh, through the hour. And the stakes uh, and the strategy and the strategic importance of Ukraine as a nation with Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, former commanding general of the U.S. Army in Europe. We'll continue our conversation in a moment at Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and NC State Jenkins MBA, featuring full-time evening and online programs designed to give students flexibility to work and learn. Additional details at mba.ncsu. Edu. And the YWCA of the Central Carolinas hosting We Believe 2022, a virtual fundraiser March 9th, presented by Bank of America and Duke Energy. Event details at ywcacentralcarolinas.org. President Biden delivers his first official State of the Union address tonight at a time of threat to democracy domestically and in Ukraine and elsewhere around the world as well. This speech is, of course, the mandated report to Congress on just how things are going. The presidents often use it as a launching pad to outline what, where they'd like the country to go. With his approval rating at all-time lows, our panel of political scientists tomorrow will lend their analysis to the president's approach, and that will be tomorrow on this program at 9. 
President Joe Biden will deliver his first State of the Union address today. The speech to Congress comes as the White House works to battle soaring inflation, curb COVID-19 infections, and confirm a new Supreme Court justice. Join us today for live coverage of the 2022 State of the Union and expert analysis from NPR News. Listen tonight starting at 9 at 90.7 WFAE. Stream us at WFAE.org. And you can also listen with the WFAE mobile app. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're talking about the situation in Ukraine and the United States and NATO's response to the Russian invasion of that nation with Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, retired former commanding general of the U.S. Army in Europe. He will be speaking today at noon at a luncheon sponsored by the uh, World Affairs Council Charlotte at the Uptown Hilton. Tickets are still available. You can get them at worldaffairscharlotte.org. Aside from the future of Ukraine as an independent nation, what do you see as being at stake here for them and for the West? Well, this is uh, so much bigger than just Ukraine uh, for a couple of reasons. On the global strategic level, uh, obviously the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party is watching very closely how this turns out. Uh, if the United States, with all of our allies and partners uh, in Europe, uh, the combined economic and diplomatic power, as well as the military power, cannot stop Kremlin uh, from doing what it's trying to do, um, then I don't think they're going to be too impressed with anything that we say about Taiwan or the uh, South China Sea in terms of sovereignty and uh, international law. So this, this has an implication there. Um, but it also is about um, this phrase, you know, international order has been used so many times that it's almost lost meaning. But if we think about it, after two world wars in the first half of the 20th century in Europe, where tens of millions of people died in the incredible uh, cost and, and destruction, the United States led an effort to put in place this so-called international order that would help provide structures um, that would prevent that from happening again. And so that's why this matters. That doesn't mean it's going to be uh, uh, perfection and happiness and paradise everywhere, but having uh, laws, agreements, institutions that can help uh, act like a governor, if you will, or, or breaks on the potential for sliding into a, an armed conflict. Um, our German allies, so important, they don't trust themselves. And so they have, they have wrapped themselves inside NATO and inside the European Union because of their own history. So these are examples. What President Putin is trying to do, of course, is turn that upside down because he feels uh, with the, with the uh, demise of the Soviet Union and the breakup to all these uh, independent countries, that they have, they've lost out somehow. And so he wants to change this, and frankly, so do the Chinese, so that um, you don't have these structures where the West and Western values are the dominant force. Uh, which leads to uh, something I don't know very much about because I don't follow Ukraine or, or Russian politics, but evidently at the, at the dawn of NATO and, and periodically throughout its existence up to today, uh, we've kind of kept Russia at bay. Would we have been better off welcoming that nation into, once it became uh, non-Soviet, welcoming that nation into the fold? Or have we set up a situation where they are legitimately threatened by the existence of NATO? Uh, we did welcome them into the fold. When, when uh, NATO went into Bosnia uh, in 1995, we had Russian soldiers with us. I mean, they were part of the implementation force. Uh, we agreed to come up with a command and control structure where they didn't report directly to NATO. They refused to do that, which is fine. So we came up with a professional military workaround for coordination of what they were doing in Bosnia. It actually worked. And I remember thinking, uh, wow, this, this, is, this might even work. I mean, this, the whole peace dividend, I mean, I believed it for a period of time. And you'll, you will know, and all your listeners will know, of course, that Russia was welcomed into all the various uh, economic um, organizations. Remember, the G7 used to be the G8, um, but uh, it was the choice of Russia. It was the choice of Russia to invade Georgia in 2008 uh, to support the Assad regime, which put uh, the civil war that only was able to keep going because of Russian support, which put millions of refugees on the road that all headed to Europe. 
and had terrible destabilizing effects across Europe. It was Russia that invaded Ukraine in 2014 and never left. So um, I think the, the idea that somehow um, if we had only invited them to do more with the West, that this, this would all be okay. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think that's the, the, way, the way that would have prevented this from happening. Although I would say that we certainly at the end of the Cold War probably acted with some hubris that we just thought, okay, everybody wants to be capitalist, everybody wants to be free and democratic, and it'll just it'll just happen. But I mean, you know, here in the United States, we've been at it for 250 years and we don't have it exactly right. And so they have no institutions in Russia that would have supported that. Talk about the strategic importance from a political and military point of view of the country itself, of Ukraine itself. It's on the, uh, it, it control, it could potentially control access from Russia, for Russia, to certain ports. Uh, but also it's, it's kind of a buffer between Russia and, 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 and Europe. So talk about, and, and this, 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 this strategic importance for Russia, at least, has gone back centuries. So talk about its importance. Now, th this is why I love maps, because when you look at the map of the Black Sea region uh, and you move the Black Sea kind of to the middle of the map, it becomes immediately apparent why this is such an important area. It's the reason that Catherine the Great annexed the Crimean Peninsula back at the end of the 18th century, because Russia has always needed a year round warm water port that would en enable it to get out into the world's oceans. They can't do that from their port in uh, Kaliningrad or St. Petersburg or other places because they're frozen part of the year. So that was why they always wanted to have the Crimean Peninsula. It was that port, particularly Sevastopol in the Black Sea. Um, so that's, that's part of what this is about. The other, another implication of course, is that Ukraine has always been known as the breadbasket uh, of Europe. Millions of people, particularly in the Middle East, get their grain from Ukraine. So this, it helps feed a large part of the world. That's it, that's a danger right now because of Russia's uh, disruption of shipping uh, uh, from Ukrainian ports. Thankfully, the Russians did not take the approach that the United States took when it went into Iraq with their shock and awe, our shock and awe campaign. The Russians seemed to come in uh, in a very muted way. They, they didn't launch a lot of bombing attacks, at least not initially. They, they didn't uh, overwhelm or take down the power grid. They didn't turn off the internet or sources of communication. What do you believe the thinking behind that approach was if they really wanted to do this in a couple of days and be done with it? Well, this goes back to your early question, earlier question, which I did a poor job of answering. I think it's partly their planning and partly their execution. They do not have the experience that uh, NATO countries, particularly the US, but others have in terms of large scale joint operational level of war, where you have to combine the effects of your army, your Navy, your Air Force, your special forces, your cyber, all of these capabilities where you bring them together to create the best effect. Uh, I was astounded um, that President Zelensky is still walking around town with, a, with his uh, iPhone saying, I'm still here. He's, the whole communications network, I mean, this is day one of lieutenant school is you take out the enemy's um, communications network. Uh, and I think this is not because they wanted to preserve it for some reason, it's because they didn't have the ability or the know-how to synchronize all of these things. I have, I have a friend, a Ukrainian officer, he told me that they have been capturing uh, multiple teams of saboteurs uh, and multiple teams of agents trying to install beacons that would guide in missiles around targets. <laughs> That's, that's decades behind us in terms of technology. And so they just haven't practiced and developed the experience. That, that's a part of it. Uh, the other part, the reason that they're bogged down is, um, again, it goes to the experience, the amount of fuel and ammunition that's being consumed always exceeds planning expectations. Because when you get into a fight, you start pouring artillery and rockets on it. Um, you've got tanks that burn up tons of fuel. Um, and, and they have to be followed by fuel trucks. These are very, very vulnerable targets. And as I look at these convoys, not only the giant one that's north of Kiev that everybody's focused on, but uh, the ones where vehicles have been destroyed, and I see how close they are to each other. That is a, that is a dead giveaway 
of an undisciplined um, trained unit because you would always, as you're approaching or in a combat environment, you would maintain separation to avoid losing all the trucks in one barrage. But yet what we see is literally bumper to bumper traffic. They're very inexperienced. The Ukrainian military has normal weapons like rocket propelled uh, grenades and things like that. And I suppose anti-tank weapons, but the ordinary rank and file citizen that has volunteered to bravely defend their own country by taking up rifles. Some of, some of these folks have never held a rifle in their lives and making Molotov cocktails. How, how effective can that be? Ordinary people with little to no experience firing weapons that they're unfamiliar with and using Molotov cocktails on tanks and other heavy equipment. How, how effective can that be? I think it's going to be extremely effective. Uh, first of all, you're talking about what will eventually be hundreds of thousands of people that are out there throughout across the country. Um, the uh, Kalashnikov there's a reason that most of the world uses these things, uh, particularly poorer countries, is because it is a relatively simple weapon to maintain, clean, and use. So we're not talking about something that's terribly sophisticated, but yet it is very effective. Um, the, and if you also think historically, you know, when the, the German Wehrmacht invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, uh, their supply lines were a massive vulnerability. The, the lines of communication that went through what is today Belarus and Ukraine were constantly under attack after the Ukrainians realized that the Germans were not there to liberate them. And so um, it was a nightmare uh, logistics situation for the, uh, the German Wehrmacht because of people with uh, rifles and Molotov cocktails. Uh, as you mentioned, Ukrainian President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky has been in almost constant communication with his citizenry as this uh, war has gone on. He uses any possible means to reach them from just talking into his iPhone and getting that message out somehow to being on television almost every morning, I am told, to speak to the Ukrainian people and let them know who they are and what they're fighting for and that he and his government are in it with them. It's a sentiment that has obviously reverberated around that country. So from a military man's point of view, what can be the impact of that kind of determination that the citizenry is witnessing on them and on the prosecution of this war? Uh, every soldier uh, wants to see their leader. I mean, uh, no matter what party the president is from or, or whatever, uh, I've witnessed it with uh, presidents from both parties out visiting troops, whether it was in Iraq or Afghanistan or Korea or coming to Fort Bragg. I mean, people turn out. They want to. That's the president. You know, and the, the incredible, uh, not just the authority, but the symbolism of the president. And so um, in, in Ukraine, I think we're seeing a guy who has um, risen to the occasion, frankly. Yeah. Um, they, you know, the, the still, I don't want to kid you, the domestic political situation inside Ukraine up until just a few months ago was not exactly... Um, uh, peaceful or uh, harmonious. I mean, they're terrible fighting, political fighting between the different parts of Ukrainian uh, parliament and the parties. So here, this situation, fortunately, Ukraine has a president that is helping to unify people against the common external threat. He, he is displaying a, a kind of courage. I don't think many of us have witnessed. I mean, I, I suppose you could compare, compare him in, in a way to Winston Churchill. And some of the things he told his people, uh, English people in, in, in World War II at the very beginnings and throughout that war. But he's displaying a, a remarkable amount of courage for any human being and certainly for a politician and certainly for a person who was up until a couple of years ago, a TV comedian. How do you explain this rising to the occasion? How does he know what to do? Well, I, I think it's a combination of all of us, you know, you, me, everybody in your studio there, you know, you have something inside of you, there's a potential. And, and hopefully when, when, the, when the time arises uh, that you're able to live up to that potential. And I think he's discovered that, um, his calling. I mean, he's an entertainer, so it's all about connecting with people. And I think he probably has taken some uh, heart also from the the soldiers uh, and people around him. Remember, Ukraine's been at war for eight years. This, what's happening now is not new. It's just the next phase. And I suspect he has taken heart from um, many of the soldiers he visited. He has visited over the last couple of years out in the trenches, 
Um, and uh, I think he's well served right now by some of his advisors. Uh, it was also important though, that President, former President Poroshenko, uh, who is no angel himself, but you know, we saw a picture of him the other day out there with his uh, weapons and his sort of battalion that he's joined. This, this is what's really important um, is that the civilian leadership uh, from the different parties in, the, in the, their parliament, the RADA, that they can put aside now internal issues and focus on the existence, the survival of their country. Yeah, and former President Poroshenko was on CNN a bunch over the weekend and uh, had, had good things to say about the man who essentially defeated him in the election. And, and he's out there, as you say, with a flak jacket on and a rifle and, and doing his part. Uh, the, the former president of this country uh, has had very little nice to say about NATO. And in fact, he kind of almost made it his mission to extricate ourselves from NATO during his presidency and probably would have taken us out uh, of NATO had he uh, gone to a second term. Is this conflict a resounding argument against that policy? Yeah, absolutely. And thank God uh, he was not successful at um, pulling us out of NATO. Look, it, it's a legitimate complaint that many of our allies uh, have not lived up to their obligations uh, in terms of investing in their own defense, including Germany, uh, as well as the others. That's, that's been the complaint of every American president since Harry Truman, uh, that allies need to do more. But at the end of the day, um, the United States, our prosperity depends on a prosperous Europe. And that's only possible if Europe is stable, safe, and secure. So not even it, so if not even one European country paid a dollar, a pound, a euro, or a krona for their own defense, it's in our interest that Europe is stable, secure, and prosperous. Secondly, even with the biggest defense budget in history, we do not have enough capacity in the United States to deal with all of the threats we have, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, terrorism. And so we need allies. And the administration has correctly emphasized allies. And I think we'll hear about that tonight in his State of the Union message. And most of our best and most reliable allies come from Europe, as well as Australia and Canada. I want to talk some more about this country's response to this in a moment, but we have an interesting question from Kevin on Facebook, for which we have 30 seconds to respond. With the indiscipline that you're seeing from the Russians, do you think that Putin sent his less experienced troops in first to prepare the way for the more well-trained soldiers, or does this undisciplined seem to be the description of Putin's army in general? And you have about 30 seconds. Uh, well, first of all, it's a great question, and, I, and I've heard that speculation, but they sent in Spetsnaz and airborne troops to try and seize airfields all around Ukraine, and they were defeated in every single instance. Uh, I think what we're seeing is, the, is the, uh, the result of years of lying, false reporting, and their readiness. Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, former commanding general of the U.S. Army in Europe, our guest. We will continue in just a moment at Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members at Opera Carolina presenting a new American opera, The Falling and the Rising, a one-act drama based on the stories of real soldiers, March 11th and 12th, tickets at 704-372-1000. And WorkSmart IT with the goal to help local businesses simple, simplify IT management, including cybersecurity, 24-hour help desk support, and cloud strategy. Tech tips and more at worksmart.com slash blog. Coming up in 20 minutes at 10 o'clock on 1A, the financial pressure on Russia for invading Ukraine ramped up over the weekend. The European Commission announced plans to cut several Russian banks from the international finance system known as SWIFT. So how effective could this be? They'll be talking about the economic consequences to Vladimir Putin of his invasion of Ukraine coming up in 20 minutes to 10 o'clock on 1A. And we will continue our conversation in 30 seconds.
Lots of changes underway in Charlotte, and WFAE's BizWorthy segment helps keep you informed. Take the challenges with the city's 2040 comprehensive plan. How to save Charlotte's tree canopy, parking around historic districts, short-term rentals. You know, some residents have complained that people are renting out Airbnbs and throwing big parties. Catch BizWorthy every Thursday on WFAE's Morning Edition at 644 and 844. Support for BizWorthy is provided by Sharon View Federal Credit Union and our members. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, former commanding general of the U.S. Army in Europe, is our guest today. And that is thanks to the World Affairs Council. He's speaking at their luncheon at noon today. Tickets are still available at worldaffairscharlotte.org. It'll be taking place at the Uptown Hilton. At the start of this conflict in Ukraine, uh, former President Donald Trump praised uh, President Putin of Russia. He described the invasion as an act of genius on Putin's part. Only in the last day or so has he praised Ukrainian President Zelensky, calling him a brave man. And this weekend at CPAC, the president, former president said, quote, the problem is not that Putin is smart, which, of course, he is smart. The problem is that our, our leaders are dumb and so far allowed him to get away with this travesty and assault on humanity. Putin is playing Biden like a drum, and it's not a pretty thing to watch. Several members of the Republican Party joined the chorus on that. And we have, of course, uh, examples of Fox News, Tucker Carlson joining the chorus on that. In fact, he's being played on Russian television with translation because of his support for Putin. Republican Senator Mitt Romney has called this almost treasonous. What's your reaction? I should discuss them. Um, I mean, the former president is rewriting uh, history rewriting recent history to a level that would even make President Putin blush. Um, I mean, what happened during the last four years created a massive um, vulnerability for the Russians to exploit, which they did, uh, causing us to lose trust in each other, causing us to doubt our allies. And, and I think this is part of the reason that Putin felt um, free uh, to uh, go into Ukraine. I mean, um, the because we didn't look like we were together with allies. We, we looked, we didn't have resolve. And at the end of the day, I mean, think about it, 30 nations working together. I, be, I dare you to pick your 30 best friends and you guys agree on what you're gonna have for supper or who your favorite team is. So to get 30 nations to go together on something that's so expensive and so dangerous requires real leadership. And that's what um, the current administration has made a priority. And it's to me the, the fact that anybody could call Putin smart or genius when he is responsible for the death of thousands of people and just total disregard for international law. I, I have a real hard time having any respect for that or putting any positive superlative next to it. NATO countries, including our own, have decided not to put boots on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, we're not going in. We have beefed up our presence on the eastern front of NATO, I suppose. And yet, and we keep saying we're not going to put troops on the ground. And yet Putin, over the weekend, has put his nuclear forces on high alert. How should we view that move? Well, first of all, I think it's important that we, that we don't forget what's happened here in the last few months. It was our inaction, the collective inaction of the West over the last few years, actually, after Russia invaded Georgia and then Ukraine, and we did nothing. I mean, really, we, we absolutely did nothing. We are still importing Russian crude oil today, which, which is uh, stunning to me. And we have uh, Russian oligarchs with uh, lots of property in London and in Miami and in other places. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do internally to get more transparency in our finances and, and to hold people accountable, not look the other way. But we are where we are now. Uh, Putin has uh, threatened the use of nuclear uh, force in the past. He's threatened Sweden, he's threatened Denmark, he's threatened Poland, and anybody else that joins, say, a, a missile defense network. He's used that threat. It cost him nothing to, uh, to make those threats, but it will cost him everything should he use even a low-yield uh, nuclear weapon. Well, let's, let, let's talk about, that was my next question. What would happen if he used any kind of nuclear weapon in this conflict in Ukraine or elsewhere? What would our response be? What must it be? 
Well, <laughs> that that is a hell of a question, uh, and I'm glad it's not one that I have to uh, own. But you can imagine a situation, and I've heard people speculate: what if he wants to, as a demonstration, step back from Kiev and use a low yield nuclear weapon to destroy part of Kiev, for example, to send a signal to everybody? Not only would that be a catastrophe of historic proportions, it would also have the potential for fallout, literally fallout, drifting into Poland or or a NATO country. Now, now we've got a whole nother different scenario. Um, I think that we what we want, obviously, is for China and other countries to put pressure on the Kremlin to make sure that this doesn't happen. China has zero interest in Russia using a nuclear weapon. Some people, some pundits have said that this is merely bluster on the part of Putin. Uh, he's, a, he's a bully and he likes to show off and flex his muscles. Others have said that his recent behavior and comments indicate a man who is isolated and who has become somewhat unhinged with no one able to get in his way and say no. Uh, wh what do you think is the case? And how do we deal with somebody that we can't read accurately? I, I think it's a, frankly, it's a combination. I mean, the, there is this threat, this bluster. Um, and, and in the past, it might have worked where countries, you know, European countries would have said, oh, my God, anything we will do anything to avoid a nuclear conflict. Uh, and, and I think he perhaps anticipated that he would have that sort of effect. That's not happening this time. And again, I think this goes in large part to American leadership, but also Europeans rediscovering their own spirit, rediscovering their own uh, determination, recognizing what this is uh, about. But you're exactly right, Mike, that um, we've got a guy now that uh, does seem to be not even as crisp, if you will, as he was five years ago. And that's probably a result of this uh, he, he doesn't have a lot of people around him at the table willing to say, well, boss, I'm not sure this is a good idea. Uh, and so um, there, there is, that's why, I think that's why this is so dangerous is because we're not exactly sure what's going on inside that head. And, and from recent television uh, uh, scenes, uh, he has nobody around him at the table. They're all 25 feet away on the other side of a very long table. Uh, the U.S. Uh, launched its war in Iraq uh, ostensibly because they had weapons of mass destruction, though they did not. You were the chief of operations for multinational corps Iraq in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, we also spent 20 years in Afghanistan, where you were director of operations for Regional Command South in Kandahar. Both conflicts were in response to 9-11 and our efforts to control terrorism. Neither of those nations were democracies. Ukraine is. Could it be argued that we should enter this conflict for that very reason and because Putin is acting right now as a terrorist? That's a, uh, a very interesting and compelling uh, formulation. I think that uh, you think back in 39, 1939, 1940, the United States was doing everything we could to support Great Britain, um, to keep them in the fight against Nazi Germany. Uh, although we were, there was still a huge uh, amount of domestic political pressure in the United States to stay neutral, to stay out of this war. So the Roosevelt administration did everything that we could to support them until it became apparent that it was in our interest that we would have to be involved which of course was uh, accelerated by Japan bombing us in, in 1941. So I could envision a, a scenario where the United States says, it is in our strategic interest, it's in our national security interest that we are gonna to have to step in to prevent, the, to prevent this from going any further, not just from a humanitarian standpoint, but because of the threats, the pressure it's putting on so many other uh, vital US interests. But that means the president and the Congress would have to do what did not happen in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last 20 years, is to look the American people in the eye and say, look, this is gonna be very expensive. It's gonna take years. It's gonna cost trillions of dollars, but here's why it's in our interest. This is why we have to do it and build up that support. Um, that would require real leadership. Prior to the invasion uh, of Ukraine, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg said Russia has a choice. They can either choose a diplomatic solution, but if they choose confrontation, they will pay a higher price. 
And since then, of course, sanctions have been levied uh, by almost all Western nations. Uh, Russia has been cut off in large part from the SWIFT currency exchange system. The ruble has crashed. I think it's it fell 25% or 30% yesterday. It's worth less than a penny in comparison to the right. U.S. dollar. Interest rates have risen to 20% or beyond. The Russian stock market has fallen so badly and so quickly that they've closed it for the week. And that just scratches the surface. But is it enough? Will these sanctions be felt by Putin, or are they going to fall mainly on the Russian middle and lower classes? And if that happens, given that it's a security state, can those people have any impact on what happens to Putin going forward? I have been so impressed with the Russian protesters over the last few nights that we've seen out there, knowing what was going to happen when they went out there, that the Russian police and security forces were going to uh, crack their skulls and, and throw them in the truck. Uh, but yet thousands of Russians are still going out there. I think this is important. This, this is something that uh, we need to watch. And frankly, we need to be supporting with every means possible with uh, helping the average Russian understand that conscripts are being sent from Russia into Ukraine to fight a war against a fellow Slav country. Um, is this really what you want to do? And then, of course, you're right. They're going to be feeling the price, uh, feeling the, uh, the uh, effects of these sanctions. Most sanctions tend to take time to have real effect, but you've highlighted correctly that stock market there and, and the value of the ruble um, are uh, tumbling already. I think when we have oligarchs like uh, Abramovich, the guy that apparently is worth $13 billion or something like that, he's the owner of the Chelsea Football Club in, uh, in London and UK. You know, when that guy loses his ownership of Chelsea and when he loses all eight of his yachts and, and things like that, you know, that, that will um, ramp up the pressure. But what Putin fears more than anything is being drugged through the street like Muammar Gaddafi. I, I believe that that is absolutely what he fears. That's why the Russian interior security forces are as strong as their regular armed forces. Maybe China uh, should offer him a golden bridge, uh, literally, I mean, offer him a chance to, hey, you step down, we'll take care of you. You can live your life in luxury for the rest of your days. Um, uh, otherwise, I do feel that there will be a violent end to that regime. Sounds silly to, to, to talk about this when you think about what Ukrainians are going through. But yesterday it was noted that uh, Russians suddenly could not use Apple or Google Pay at the turnstiles in the metro system in Moscow. And some of them are concerned uh, that their credit cards will stop working. In fact, one Western reporter was asked to pay his hotel bill yesterday in advance because they feared they couldn't get the money from the credit card company going forward. That seems silly. But it's absolutely crippling in a modern economy, isn't it? Yeah, sure. I mean, think of everybody that's listening to your voice right now. Uh, what they focus on most of the most of the time, correctly and normally, is the so-called kitchen table issues: pay, school, medical care, um, infrastructure, the stuff that they feel every day. When that starts getting impacted because of terrible decisions by your leader, uh, then people want to do something about it. Uh, and the normal election process is not going to work there. So that's why I think the potential, uh, and I'm not advocating for it, but I'm, I think the potential for a violent end here in the coming months is real. Uh, our our uh, uh, intelligence uh, services have excelled in this conflict. They have pretty much... Uh, bec only because we know this because they've released and declassified information well in advance of what they would normally do. And they've telegraphed what accurately telegraphed what Putin is going to do before he does it, which has to really frustrate him and the people prosecuting the war on his behalf. But that says a lot about our intelligence services. The other thing that we decided to do was freeze assets. And now they're talking about seizing assets. Why wasn't that top of mind? Just take what they own and don't give it back. Yeah. Um, first of all, I love the uh, this releasing of intelligence. I've never seen it like this before. And for the first time in my memory, we have the advantage. We have the initiative in the information space where you have Russian leadership saying, we're not doing this. We're not doing this. We're not doing this. And obviously they were. And they've been called out. And I think uh, the fact that all of the nations of NATO and the EU have agreed with 
the predictions or the announcements by the US government is impressive. That means that they believe it also, that they're seeing it for themselves and they believe it. I mean, remember 20 years ago, we said we thought we had proof of chemical weapons in Iraq. So you could, you could understand why many Europeans would be skeptical about a claim like this. So they've seen it themselves and they are believing it. I, I think um, this has been an, an important development. Former uh, CIA officer Paul Colby, a Russian expert, says that if this move into Ukraine succeeds, if Russia is successful, it could cause problems for Putin, uh, even if it ends tomorrow or today. He said Putin is going to try to swallow a porcupine here, and it is going to be hard for the Russians to bear, the Russian bear, to digest it. Yeah. What does he face if he is successful? Well, first, of course, he's not going to be successful. Uh, Kiev is a city of 3 million people. Um, they have about 150,000 troops, 170,000 Russian troops. Uh, the stadium here in Charlotte holds 70,000 people. So to provide context to those numbers that sound like a lot, all of a sudden, that's not a lot. You, you could not encircle the city of Kiev, even if it was not defended with that many troops. So I don't think that they're going to be successful at all at trying to take Kiev. But let's just say they were. Um, it will be a nightmare for the Russians, much worse than anything they ever experienced in Afghanistan. Um, there, there will be Russian soldiers getting killed every single day, uh, and, and they will not be able to sustain themselves. It, it will be a disaster. I have 20 seconds. We have not heard anything about Russian casualties in this war. Do we have any idea of how many soldiers have been wounded or killed in this conflict? Uh, the Russian minister, or excuse me, the Ukrainian minister of defense says over 5,000 so far. Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, retired former uh, commanding general of U.S. forces in Europe. Thank you so much for this hour. Thanks for the privilege, Mike. Charlotte Talks with Mike Collins is a production of 90.7 WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from Mazda of South Charlotte. Our executive producer is Wendy Herkey. The senior producer is Aaron Kiever. Our producers are Gabe Altieri and Jesse.